interesting. Oh, there you go. We'll see. Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome. It's Wednesday, April 19th, 2023. It's 9 o'clock, and we're here in the center here in 555 Court Street, Northeast in Salem, for our weekly board session. As always, we start with the Pledge of Allegiance, so if you please join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, we have one person signed up for public comment. It uh, looks like a Keisha. She's not in here. Not here. Okay. Uh, then we'll just roll right into um, our presentation. Uh, first up, we have Sherry with a... Well, before we begin, um, we have a... Can I have a motion to remove item number five? There was a mistake made in that contract, and so we're going to push it off to um, a few weeks from today. Sure, I make a motion to remove item number five from the action agenda under Health and Human Services. Consider approval of amendment number 10 to the incoming funds participating provider service agreement with Pacific Source Community Solutions to add 24 million for a new contract total of 62,172,659 dollars to implement and administer covered services under the Oregon Health Plan. I'll second. Go ahead. I'll second the motion to remove it. We have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Mr. Bethel, how do you vote? Aye, sorry. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Uh, the motion passes. Okay, Sherry, now please give us the 2022 uh -huh. annual volunteer report. Oh, good morning. Uh, for the record, I am Sherry Lindner, volunteer service services coordinator for Marion County uh, in the human resources team here at the county. So yes, I am here uh, this week with our 2022 volunteer annual report. So we strive to recognize and appreciate our volunteers every day, but National Volunteer Week is a great time to celebrate them and their contributions that they make to the overall health and well-being here at Marion County. So with that, I'm happy to present the 2022 volunteer report. You each have a copy. There are copies on the uh, table here, and folks can also find a PDF printable version on our website. The annual report reflects on the time and energy of uh, our volunteers for the calendar 2000 for the calendar year 2022. And then, just before I start, I want to just remind the commissioners and anyone watching that I am here really representing a team of employees here at the county. There are about 50 uh, county staff that manage or somehow work uh, with our volunteers. And so on their behalf and on behalf of the volunteers, I'm happy to share highlights from this year's report. <clears throat> so. I always like to start with the numbers, and in 2022, we had 1,394 volunteers who together donated 56,168 hours of service. And we know and we feel that our, value, our volunteers are invaluable, but we do assign a monetary value to their hours, and it's just one of the ways that we demonstrate the benefits of hosting volunteers. So we use the uh, national rate from the independent sector and based on the indep independent sector's 2022 published rate of 29.95, the time donated by Marion County volunteers in 2022 is valued at over $1.6 million. And then I like to break up our volunteers in buckets. And so I uh, have them divided into buckets representing interns, uh, advisory board members, and then what I call program volunteers. And using that breakdown, uh, so 49 individuals were interns, practicum students, or AmeriCorp members. 164 individuals volunteered for an advisory board or a committee and 1,183 volunteers donated time to a county program. And uh, worth noting uh, is the increase in our, our interns. So I went back and looked at 2019, which would be what I would consider sort of our pre-pandemic numbers, 
And in 2019, we hosted 24 interns and practicum students. And in 2022, we hosted 47 intern and practicum students. So it's really exciting to see the county uh, increase our capacity to host students. It benefits the entire community. Uh, it benefits the county and the students as well. So quickly, I'll just talk about interns. Uh, we have intern practicum students and AmeriCorps members that volunteer throughout the county. Um, as I mentioned, 47 students uh, in 2022 and two AmeriCorps rare members donated time. And in all, collectively, they donated 11,000 hours of service. And then the other bucket, advisory board members. Uh, the Board of Commissioners, as you know, but for members of the audience and those that might be watching, you have appointing authority to county advisory boards and committees, as well as uh, appointing authority to designated positions on two uh, other committees. They're, we call them multi-jurisdictional committees. 164 individuals served uh, in 2022, donating 2,441 hours of service. So this slide, just if you want to read it, you can see all the advisory boards and uh, which department uh, has responsibility or staffs those groups. Um, and I just want to mention that we have like very, very committed advisory board members. Uh, they often serve more than one term and several serve on more than one committee. And we actually have one person right now that serves on three committees. And then I wanted just to give you an idea of the boards that have members who have served more than 10 years. So the Ambulance Service Area Advisory Committee, Board of Property Tax Appeals, the Budget Committee, the Fair Board, the Local Alcohol and Drug Planning Committee, Marion Water Quality Advisory Committee, the Parks Commission, the Planning Commission, the Public Safety Coordinating Council, and the Solid Waste Management Advisory Council all have members who have served over 10 years. We have a handful of board members who have served over 15 years, and we actually have one uh, board member, uh, somebody that serves on the budget committee that has served for almost 25 years here at the county. So uh, that kind of touched on those other two buckets. Uh, I wanna talk just a little bit about what I'm calling program volunteers today. The majority of our volunteers serve in programs. So I'll highlight a few of those today. I'm gonna to start with the dog shelter. Uh, as I've reported here before to you, and you've probably heard uh, through other means, um, our dog shelter is operating at full capacity. They have been operating at full capacity since I was here last year making the same report. Uh, shelter staff describe their volunteers as the backbone of the operations and they realize that the contributions of those volunteers really literally save dogs' lives. In 2022, the shelter received a record-breaking number of dogs. They had 1,257 dogs come through their door and volunteers work side by side with the staff to uh, identify behavioral issues, to provide training and socialization, all the things that really increase the dog's chance of having a success successful adoption. In 2022, volunteers walked, played, and trained dogs. They care for dogs as they come out of surgery. They care for the shelter by doing laundry, cleaning, and food prep. They attend outreach events like Saturday Market and they assist potential doctor, adopters kind of go through that adoption process. And then there's also a large group of volunteers that provide temporary shelter through the foster program. And then I'm gonna talk really quickly about environmental services, but you're gonna hear a lot more from uh, that team today. Uh, but as you are aware, the Master Recyclers Program, which was really a kind of a signature program here at Marion County, was uh, recently updated and reintroduced as the Marion Resourcers. 
And I think the concept is pretty similar to the master recyclers. The community members come, they take the training, and then they have the option to partner with our uh, environmental services team to share strategies and solutions then with the broader community. Resourcers and other volunteers help at events like repair fairs and toy swaps. They conduct food, food waste audits. They assist with youth education. They help with Earth Day planning. And in 2022, volunteers participated in that program review, and they helped with things like doing beta, tested, beta testing for the updated training. And then I always want to touch on the Marion County Fair, because that is a uh, special event <clears throat> that there really are 12 people that carry the bulk of the work to put on the Marion County Fair. Uh, the fair board and key volunteers donate countless hours. They plan and manage the county fair. Collectively, volunteers manage the barns, the 4-H activities, food and commercial vendors, the carnival, the entertainment, sponsorships, competitions and exhibits, uh, special events that happen at the fair, all the facilities uh, issues, parking, all the financial and budget functions that need to happen for the fair to, to uh, be produced. In 2022, our fair welcomed 26,000 visitors. They had uh, break, record-breaking sponsorships and the junior market auction brought in over a million dollars for the youth that participated. So. That is a real win, and none of those things would be possible without the dedication of the fair board, the key volunteers, who then engage with uh, their partners and event volunteers to put on the event. And the sheriff's office has quite a few programs operating through that department. Search and rescue volunteers use their skills and equipment to assist in searches for lost, missing, and deceased individuals, primarily in our outdoor, urban, and rural wilderness areas. Those volunteers are certified through the Search and Rescue Academy, and then they commit to 30 hours of additional training each year. And the training that they take builds their core competencies in areas such as maps and compass use, uh, treating hypothermia, heat stroke, crime scene procedures, search procedures and patterns, tracking techniques, radio communication, and wilding, wilderness survival. And I know there's more, but there's a few on the list. Their service, though, really goes above and beyond sort of the core purpose of the program. And you can find our search and rescue uh, volunteers really helping whenever the need arises. In 2022, at some of the, uh, we had some recent ice storms. Those members provided transportation for hospital staff who were unable to get to and from work, and they also assisted in Mills and Wheels, uh, Mills on Wheels food deliveries. Another program with the sheriff's office is the cadet unit. The cadet unit is made up of youth ages 14 and a half to 21. Those volunteers, uh, they come on board, they complete a written test, an oral interview, they go through a very thorough background check with the sheriff's office, and then they complete the, sh the uh, cadet academy, and then they commit to at least 20 hours of service and training each month. Cadets help with security and traffic control at many of the community events that we're familiar with and that we attend. That includes the County Fair, Bauman's Harvest Festival, the Covered Bridge Community Thanksgiving Dinner, Shop with a Cop, Christmas of Hope, and National Night Out. So the Sheriff's Office has many, many committed volunteers. And I'm going to mention one today, um, Ginny B. Uh, anyone that is spent time in the sheriff's office is familiar with Jenny and you can almost always find her at those special events that I mentioned. But uh, the other thing that Jenny does for the sheriff's office is she supports the concealed 
license holders in um, that program with clerical work. So she uh, generates the renewal letters and she scans documents and she does some different clerical tasks for the sheriff's office. But I want to mention that in Marion County, we have 24,500 concealed license holders. So that work that Jenny does means that our, our paid staff are able to do a lot more work. They're able to accommodate more appointments and focus on other things that are important to the program. So volunteers like Jenny make a uh, really a significant impact every day. So the Sheriff's Office, in addition to interns, uh, admin, and special event volunteers, there are also about 80 volunteers that uh, come into the Marion County Jail and they provide spiritual and recovery support for adults in custody at the jail. That's just a snapshot, um, but in all, 220 volunteers partnered with the Sheriff's Office in 2022. And then the last program I want to just talk about quickly is the Victim Assistance Program. That is a part of the District Attorney's Office. Victim advocates help victims exercise their rights within the criminal justice system. So they guide them through the legal process, but more than that, they also kind of walk alongside them and they connect them to really any services and supports that they might, might need. So basic needs, housing, they can also help um, them like go through the process to get secure protective orders if that is necessary. In addition to the victim advocates, they also host uh, sexual assault response volunteers. Um, and that's a pretty um, deep topic. I don't want to go into it too much, but I will say that these are specially trained volunteers that actually accompany victims at the hospital when they're going through the forensic exam. And they provide them obviously the support in that moment, but also support that they may need following that. Volunteer advocates and interns play such an important role with this uh, program because they, they do a, a lot of the similar work as the paid staff, um, but because they are able to walk side by side with staff, they really increase staff's capacity for case management, um, they, they help with at outreach events. Um, they help manage some of the office tasks. They can even attend grand jury hearings uh, if needed. So you've heard a little bit about how you can volunteer here at the county. Uh, many of our programs accept volunteers year round. But we do have a lot of programs that actually uh, volunteers need to start by taking some type of a training. And uh, so quickly I'll mention the Sheriff's Office Search and Rescue and Cadet Unit. Search and Rescue usually take applications in November and they start their training in December. The Cadet Unit usually does their training in January. I think we just had a cohort of cadets graduate uh, just this last month. Victim assistants, so they actually break their training into two trainings. You can take the, the uh, basic uh, victim advocate training. That's offered twice a year, usually in March and September. And then the sexual assault response training is uh, then offered usually in July. And uh, folks can visit our website for information on uh, anything that uh, we're currently recruiting for or ongoing opportunities. I also encourage folks to follow social media. So the county has a Facebook, Instagram, the Sheriff's Office has their own account, Environmental Services has their, their own account. And uh, social media is probably where you're gonna see things the, the fastest. <coughs> So a couple of um, opportunities that are uh, we're really recruiting for and the need is there right now. As mentioned um, earlier, the dog shelter. 
the dog shelter, that is an ongoing uh, need, and I would encourage folks to go to the dog shelter website. They have a lot of information on um, what exactly volunteers do. They have their own application, so you'll want to um, go through their process to get connected with their volunteer manager. The fair is going to be opening up for recruitment uh, very soon. So we already have our fair board members and our key volunteers, but they'll be recruiting soon for superintendents. So those are volunteers that help with specific um, open class competitions. So if you are passionate about quilts, there could be a, a role for you to play as a competition superintendent. And then they will be recruiting for event volunteers in the next couple months. So those are folks that are just coming to the fair for a two to four hour shift and they are uh, in most cases, they're actually the folks that are on the grounds, engaging with the fair visitors, helping them find information, um, helping them, if anything were to go amiss, um, they're spread throughout the fairgrounds during the fair. And then I'll just quickly mention advisory boards because we almost always have vacancies on our advisory boards. Um, we recruit, uh, ongoing we will accept applications at any time for advisory boards and then we do very specific recruitments when vacancies occur and folks can find that information on our website uh, which is going to be co.marion.or.us and uh, the quickest way to find it is if you're on our website just scroll down to the popular links and there's a link down there for volunteers um, otherwise, you're going to have to go through HR, and, but we are there on the website under Human Resources Volunteer Services. And I've lost my mouse. There we go. And in closing, I just want to really express my gratitude to our volunteers. They strengthen our resolve. They inspire us, and they really do help set us on a great path uh, for 2023 and beyond. I want to thank you, commissioners. You are huge supporters of our volunteer programs and our volunteers, and uh, that, if, if you weren't supporting it, it would be very difficult to uh, keep the support alive at the department level. Um, and with that, I will open, see if you have any questions or anything else you want to hear more about. I just have one question. I didn't see on your report any report of the volunteers that support elections. Do you track that? We do not utilize volunteers in our elections. <clears throat> we get a lot of inquiries. So now something could change every year, but so I'm going to speak historically since I've been here. What we do instead of util utilizing volunteers, the clerk's office actually hires those folks, the extra folks that they need in as temporary staff. And so they would, if, if they don't have enough people that are coming back from last year, then they will open actually a recruitment. And you would find that the same place you find any of our other job listings. Okay, so the people that come and do observations and such, they don't actually, they're not tracked, they're just people that show up? Okay, so that's something different, and I'm guessing that that's tracked through the clerk's office through some other system, because they're, they're volunteering for other organizations, they just have access to come in here, but I will check with the clerk's office. Okay. And just I'd be double interested check. to know how many hours of volunteers in the community are participating in our elections, both May and November, <coughs> when they occur. Sure. And um, email, if I email yeah, information to you, will that be yeah, thank great? You. Okay. Great. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, Mr. Chair, thank you. And I just want to uh, compliment Commissioner Bethel and uh, Sherry for uh, in the last couple of years, how the outreach <laughs> to recruitment is, has changed as a result of your willingness, your pushing, leading uh, to say, hey, what, when we have an opening, let, let us try to help bring some people in. And I think it's made a big difference in the last couple of years of, of getting some people involved. So yes. thank you for your role in that and, and, and allowing the board to uh, be involved 
more. Support. I really appreciate that support. And what I will add to that, where I really see a difference because of your commitment and involvement, is that we are getting more geographical representation on our boards. Perfect. And I know that's a priority for the commissioners. It's often a priority that's actually laid out in writing for an advisory board. It might be included in their bylaws. Uh, but that is a, a, a huge issue, is getting the geographical representation. Um, so we have folks from all over the county that come to the table, um, are part of those discussions, and part of developing the recommendations that ultimately come up then uh, to, to your table. Great. That's great. Thank you. Well, thank you to all of our volunteers. Yes. I, we have, well, you met a few volunteers last week, and we really have some amazing volunteers and I think uh, probably any organization in this county will tell you the same thing there is something I don't know that we're unique but we, we have we have a very <laughs> very committed uh, you know community and individuals that uh, like to be involved in we invite them to be involved at the county level and if they have any questions they can always reach me at volunteer at co.marion.or.us that email and I'll answer their questions and if I can't I'll connect them with the right person. Thanks Sherry. Thank you Sherry. Thank, Thank you. you Sherry. Okay next up uh, we have uh, we're going to consider a, a approval of a proclamation designating April 22nd 2023 as Earth Day in Marion County. Come on up Tom. So that's why you wear the shirt. That's it. That's it. <laughs> He's the only one that followed my ask. I didn't even do it. <laughs> I didn't hear it. I didn't. I had, I had I, tea with the commissioners the other day. I'm wearing my it was expressed by some of the folks that they couldn't actually believe that I might actually wear the shirt. It felt a little bit like a dare, and I was like, well, well challenge accepted. Well, the upside is, is that the dare, he did it. Yeah. 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 No, thank you very much. We appreciate that. Um, so for the record, Tom Kissinger, the Waste Reduction Program Supervisor, here seeking approval of a proclamation recognizing April 22nd, 2023 as Earth Day in Marion County. Uh, last year we kicked off our inaugural Earth Month celebration. Uh, and We are continuing that new tradition again this year uh, by engaging the community in a month-long uh, public outreach campaign to reduce waste, improve water quality, and highlight our county parks. Uh, the culmination of this will be a free event this Saturday, April 22nd, from 12 to 4, at Spong's Landing County Park, just outside of Kaiser. Uh, and that's a free community event with nature walks, live music, terrarium building, all sorts of different arts and crafts, and then an educational scavenger hunt with our partners where people can learn more about how to reduce waste and better their environment here in Marion County. Uh, staff here are here today, and I'd like to recognize them for all their hard work. Um, they are really the, the stars of the show here. They're the ones who put on this event, and they dedicate countless hours and time with volunteers. I believe we have 21 volunteers. 27 now, that's good. 27 volunteers joining us for this event. Um, this is also our probably our biggest recruitment day of the year for the new Marion Resourcers and the former Master Recycler Program. Um, I do want to highlight, and I always like to highlight this volunteer, uh, Sherry actually pointed this out to me. We had a volunteer who participated in Earth Day last year, then took the Marion Resources class and has now put in an application to join Parks Commission. So this really is an opportunity to engage the public and get people involved in all of the programs that we do in environmental services. But I'd like to highlight our team. We've got Dakota Tangretti, who is our uh, Waste Reduction Coordinator who leads the Marion Resources Program. Uh, Rachel Van Wert, another uh, Waste Reduction Coordinator who leads the EarthWise program. Uh, Yancey Gordon, our graphic designer extraordinaire who comes up with all these wonderful designs. Uh, she is our Communications Coordinator. And then Stephanie Rosentrader, who's our Environmental Specialist and helps build all those wonderful websites and GIS hubs that you see for this program. Um, so just want to thank them so much for all their time that they put into this. And with that, I'll open it to any questions. I don't have any questions. I'm actually going to show up this year. Awesome. Come see yeah, it. Yeah, come get some free ice cream. Well, come see the event. I'll pass on the ice cream, right. but I'm excited right. to be there. Awesome. Somebody else can have it. I'm just sure that's, that's the only thing I wrote down right there. Ice cream, <laughs> question mark. <laughs> that's good. There is. There is. There is. Commissioner so Kimber, you can have mine. Year. I will not be there this year. I'm sorry. I was there last year. It, yeah. was, it was a great event. Well attended. We had good weather, and I'm yep. hoping, hoping that, for it again. that it may, you maybe get a window. Yep. 
woke up this morning in Detroit with snow on the ground again. In fact, you believe it, right? As long as it melts <laughs> so and slides into the room. It did. It would melt it off. It, it, it was 36 degrees. But yep. uh, I wore my bicycle tie. There you go. There right. you go. I'm not That's quite. Sunny. I didn't know there was. It's not exactly Earth, Earth you know, Day, but yeah. you know. When I got here and I said, okay, it's Earth. I looked at the agenda and I go, oh, shoot, I forgot my shirt. So, just to point out, that is actually one of the activities. So we have a passport, and every year we do the passport to sustainability, which gives people opportunities to learn about ways that they can engage in waste reduction and different programs. And actually, one of them is walk or ride a bike to work. I so did you say waste fit. waste reduction? So if I ride, a bike, I walk. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, yeah. Where would they find that passport if they're interested? Uh, you can see it on our Facebook page. Uh, as Sherry mentioned, Environmental Services does have their own Facebook page, and we post on there. I believe the county page is also cross-posted as well. Uh, and you can also find it on the Environmental Services website. If you go to the Marion County website and go to the Environmental Services Division page. Great. Yancy, place. will you send me links and email for that? Thank you. Ready for a motion? I'm ready. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I'll move that we approve a proclamation designating April 22nd, 2023 as Earth Day in Marion County. I second the motion. We have a motion a second. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 The motion passes. Okay. Uh, you want to kick us off? Sure. I'd be happy to. Before the Board of Commissioners for Marion County, Oregon, in the matter of proclaiming April 22nd, 2023 as Earth Day in Marion County. This matter came before the Marion County Board of Commissioners at its regularly scheduled public meeting on April 19th to proclaim April 22nd as Earth Day in Marion County. Whereas Earth Day was first celebrated on April 22nd, 1970. Remember that year? Nope. Uh, with the goal of inspiring and, and appreciating of our appreciation of our nation's natural resources through conservation, protection, and whereas the celebration of this day marks an annual review of and commitment to the principles that first Earth Day, and whereas Marion County is blessed with a wealth, wealth of bountiful woodlands and waterways, often most visibly showcased in our parks and other public lands that enrich the lives of both residents and visitors alike, providing irreplaceable habitat for countless flora and fauna, sustainable natural resources, and many scenic recreational opportunities. And? Whereas special Earth Day events are offered to encourage residents to identify what they can personally do, to protect the environment and make Marion County a cleaner and greener place to live and work. Now therefore, we, the Marion County Board of Commissioners, do hereby proclaim April 22nd, 2023 as Earth Day. We encourage all citizens to become engaged in their local communities and join efforts to help maintain and improve Marion County's urban and rural environments. Dated at Salem, Oregon, this 19th day of April, 2023. Y'all right. wanna take a picture? I think that'd be great. All right. Oh. Show us up with your shirt. He has to stand the middle so the balance is out. There's lots oh, of balance. Yeah. I'm not even gonna be that shirts. special. Chair, I, I just think it, that, um, just asking Dakota is like about the new program. 
that, that was one of the things I did. I think my first six months here was took the master recycling class. And uh, it, it's really been um, a great education and glad that we're still doing it because uh, it, the more we can educate people about, I mean, all the time, right? And it's just going to help us because, you know, we, we talked, I was at down at, I think I told you I was down at um, Corvallis for mm -hmm. talking trash down there and got engaged with a gentleman who um, uh, basically engaged talking with him basically didn't want anything in a landfill and didn't want anything a waste energy <laughs> facility and mm -hmm. basically I say I looked at him and said hey look we can do everything we can to reduce you know in, in our personal life and reuse and then recycle but you're still gonna have stuff left and where are you gonna put it and what are you gonna do with it and uh, he said, well, I, I think waste energy is, is the best thing. I said, well, that's what we do here. And he goes, yeah, but you don't do it right. And I go, oh, I'm gonna lose. So anyways, I love what those guys are doing to help, um, you know, just do practical stuff um, that is realistic, not, you know, pie in the sky. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I was just thinking about a bill that's in the legislature that was really annoying me yesterday because it's a bill, um, written by a legislator out of the Portland area to ban styrofoam containers in Oregon, but not products that contain styrofoam coming into Oregon. So they're trying to, which I understand, balance this system of styrofoam production, which I don't <laughs> seek and or use, but they specifically called out <laughs> eggs and stating that, you know, they everywhere has to be hindered in Oregon on the use of styrofoam except for companies that import it here. <laughs> That's... It doesn't make any sense yeah. to me. It should be all or nothing, in my opinion, when it comes to that. And we can bill. recycle styrofoam here in Marion County. Yep. At our um, uh, market, Fresh Start Market. Yeah. The reason the bill was introduced in in um, twenty twenty one and it failed because there's a producer in the Portland market <laughs> of. Um, styrofoam recycling so they go and collect it from places and they they do, whatever they do with it i don't know exactly but that company was like you're going to put me and these hundreds of employees out of work because we're doing something positive but yet there's still going to be styrofoam here but we won't be able to manage it because you're taking away our um the, like the conveyor belt of it that comes in i just think it's really interesting and not a well-researched piece of legislation yeah. from the, from over there and it's it bothers me that they don't talk to local jurisdictions about how we do things and how they can help us improve um, our systems at the local level instead they just want to blanket you know make a rule that we all have to figure out how to deploy unintended consequences yeah, yeah. so annoying all right anyway thank you mr chair for letting us run no problem all <laughs> right let's move on to the consent agenda uh, Mr. Chair, I move to approve the consent calendar under Board of Commissioners OLCC application recommended approval for Silver Falls Country Store LLC DBA Silver Falls <laughs> County Store. Under Public Works, approve an order appointing Gregory Walsh as the emergency Marion County Emergency Management Director. And I'll second the motion. The motion is second. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 aye the motion passes. Okay, Ryan, are you here? Next up, we have Ryan Matthews. We're going to consider approval of an incoming funds intergovernmental agreement with the Oregon Health Authority in the amount of $1,140,000 to provide Medicaid administrative claiming services uh, through June 30th, 2028. Good morning, Ryan. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, for the record, Ryan Matthews. I'm the administrator with Marion County Health and Human Services. And I am here requesting an agreement with Oregon Health Authority to reimburse us for Medicaid administrative claiming services. And I'll just be referring to these as MAC. That's the acronym, and that's usually how these services are referred to. Uh, I do want to point out that the initial agreement here of $1.1 million is a bit ambitious. We, uh, this is not money that will be sort of sent to us in a lump sum or a one twelfth period of time. This is, it's a five-year contract, and this is our up to amount. Uh, we have to provide services and bill to get paid. And, and our average quarterly invoice is sort of in that, like, ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollar range. So very unlikely that we would approach, you know, anything near the, the $1.1 I did want to point that out. 
Um, this is a little bit unusual for Medicaid services. So most of the time when we think of Medicaid, we think of health care services that are determined medically necessary and they're billed through billing codes by licensed or credentialed providers. And MAC is really a program that's designed to reimburse for services that assist the Medicaid population, but they're not otherwise reimbursable and they're not necessarily provided by a, a clinical uh, component. Um, the services usually include things like outreach and application assistance, uh, referral coordination and training of Medicaid services, transportation and translation, and then system coordination with other agencies or providers. Uh, we, we currently have eight individuals in our MAC pool, um, and those individuals, every quarter, they submit surveys on four days that are just kind of randomly assigned. They code their time based on the activities that they're performing that fall under MAC, and then we're able to bill for sort of a percentage of their time that they were able to, to accumulate based on the survey. We enter that information into a web portal that determines how much we're able to claim. Um, and like I said, it's usually 20,000 or so a, a quarter based on this. Uh, historically, it was a little bit larger at one time. Our pool has kind of shrunk uh, historically over time. Like I said, we only have eight individuals. I think at our peak, we maybe had close to 20. Uh, part of that is we do, we do less services like in our public health clinic than we used to. And so that tends to be a lot of the place where, where staff work that, that do work that kind of fits within this component. So people who are kind of at front reception of our, of our public health clinic, checking people in, coordinating, making referrals, uh, helping them get signed up with OHP, that, those sorts of activities. Um, so I don't know if there's any questions related to this contract. Any questions for that? Mm. I think it's pretty straightforward. Yeah. Okay. I'll take the motion. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I'll move that we approve incoming funds in our government agreement with the Oregon Health Authority in the amount of $1,140,000 to provide Met Medicaid administrative claiming services through June 30, 2028. I'll second the motion. We have a motion to second. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 The motion passes. Thank you, Ryan. Are you taking on Phil's? Uh, I am. Phil's out unexpectedly, so I've got the next two topics also. Okay. Kick us off. Sure. So once again, for the record, Ryan Matthews, Administrator with Marion County Health and Human Services. And I'm here seeking approval of an amendment to a contract for services with Carol's Group Home. This will add $80,000 for a new contract total of $150,000 to provide services to uh, individuals that reside in the Carol's Group Home. Uh, so this is similar to, we've had a couple contracts in recent board session that are they're all kind of very similar to these. And these are all related to the intergovernmental agreement with Oregon Health Authority for our mental health services that were, were extended. And so now we're extending the contracts uh, for each of these, these group homes. We receive funding for adult residential and foster care services that we don't provide. It's more of a pass through. So we receive funding from the state and then based on uh, where people reside in Marion County and the, the sort of the billable rate and number of bed days. We receive invoices from foster hair care and residential providers and then we, we pay them and get reimbursed through our contract with Oregon Health Authority. So Carol's group home actually has 10 beds and it's for uh, males only and, and it, they have to have a mental health diagnosis. Uh, currently there are nine individuals in their beds and they have one referral pending to, to get filled. Uh, this is a residential treatment facility that is usually sort of the, the first step down from either a Oregon State Hospital or like an SRTF or other acute uh, inpatient setting. They're placed in a residential treatment facility where they receive uh, mental health workers that help support them there. They you know, provide meals, um, on, they have on-site staffing, usually 24 hour staffing for individuals. And they help really with skill building and life skills, so helping with hygiene and just kind of how to manage and, and navigate themselves now and to try to integrate them more into society and, and with the ultimate goal of stepping down into lower level of care. So uh, that's kind of the continuum that we, that we seek with, with these individuals. And so this would be for us to reimburse individuals who are, are referred to Carol's. Uh, they do have, you know, people do have the right to, cho to choose. So people who choose to live in this setting do consent to that and accept this as, as where they want to live. And then we are here to sort of facilitate making sure Carol's is reimbursed for the services they're providing and for, for, the, for the bed. Um, and then we, like I said, we get reimbursed from the state for that. So that, that's what this agreement is intended to fund. Uh, I don't know if there's any specific questions related to this one. Oh, sure I do. Okay. So, um, Obviously, we have this major issue in Oregon right now with 
aid and assist is the primary topic that we're hearing in the news, but specifically with people who have chronic and severe mental health issues on our streets and or just among us in our community. Um, I think I heard you say that individuals who live here um, consent to live here. Is that what you said? Yes. How do they get referred here? Uh, they would use uh, most of the time. They're going to be coming down from high, higher levels of care, so they're going to be detained, <laughs> like maybe perhaps they're in a acute inpatient setting or like an SRTF. But they're like, you know, they don't need this level of care anymore. They've kind of built their skills. Their level of acuity and seriousness with their mental health issues have, have diminished enough to where we feel like they can have a slightly less restrictive setting. And so they'll get referred to try to free up beds at higher level of care for people that, that are coming out and need it. We try to you know, be able to have sort of a continuum where people continually step down to create space yeah. in the SRTF for that next aid and assist individual that needs to come out of the hospital. So that, that's, that's the goal. So usually they'll be referred from those entities to say, you know what, they don't need the level of care that we're providing here. It's very costly. It's, it's uh, more restrictive. And, and so they'll refer and look for opportunities in residential treatment facilities in the community to get them into lower level of care. So the only way for individuals to enter into this group home is if they have somehow integrated into the Oregon State Hospital or an SRTF system? I would say it's not the only way. Like, I don't think all 10 of their individuals there potentially are that uh, so you can get referrals just based on so we could be an outpatient provider and we could assess someone and determine oh wow they they need residential level of care and, and we would look to make referrals and see what capacity is available so you could come in either direction I just think oftentimes when you're talking the higher level residential treatment facilities it tends to be you're flowing kind of from top down um, but it but it can come the other way too if people are, are are in maybe sometimes people could be in lower levels of care and it's realizing that they're failing at that like that is not working and then they're going to try to step up and say oh you know what they need more staffing they maybe can't survive you know they, they can't uh, succeed in a program that maybe only has day staffing they really need 24 hours so they would look to step up into a into a residential facility like this that's 24 hour staffing so it could go either direction but again they have to consent to all of this ex outside of the SRTF or Oregon State Hospital yeah yeah right? unless you're you know it's something related to a criminal activity where you're right. sort of sentence or referred to, to a facility or a civil commitment or you know something of that way yes they, they're, they're consenting to treatment and then they're consenting to live in a facility that will allow those supports around them and then they have to participate in the house rules so here you're living with you know nine other individuals you have to follow the house rules you have to play well with others you have to you know not be disruptive and start to or engage in behaviors that maybe put others at risk and so there's there's times where people then fail out of, of these kind of programs. And is there a timeline as far as how long they can or cannot be in these programs? Um, I don't know that there's a, I don't think there's usually a statutory one. I mean, it's usually based on kind of your, your treatment plan, but some people are going to be in residential care in these kind of settings. Could be for a long time. I mean, it could okay. be for years. Yeah. Thank you. Just I expect a follow up from me on this. <laughs> okay. Sure thing. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm, I'm, sure, sure. I move to approve amendment number two to the contract for services with Carol's Group Care Home Incorporated to add $80,000 for a new contract total of $150,000 to provide client services for youth and young adults in transition to residential services through June 30th, 2023. I'll second the motion. We have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion passes. Okay, um, and you got one more. Is that right, Ryan? I do, yes. So once again, for the record, Ryan Matthews, Administrator with Marion County Health and Human Services. And this is another incoming fund agreement, uh, this time with uh, Oregon Department of Human Services, so ODHS, and the Office of Vocational Rehabilitation Services. And it's for 300,000 through June 30th of 2025. This is related to our supported employment program. And so for those kind of unaware, we have a supported employment program that works with individuals who have mental health challenges, uh, but ultimately want to you know, set some career goals and work towards uh, you know, finding employment. Uh, and so we have supported employment specialists that work to provide things like financial assistance. So that could be maybe somebody needs an outfit to be able to go on interviews with. They want a suit and tie, so we would help them go, go work for those or maybe there's specific work really you know if they want to get into construction and you need steel-toed boots or you know just other things so this program kind of helps them obtain you know special things that they need to be able to do the work that they that they want to do 
Um, they work with vocational rehabilitation in terms of job placement. Uh, we perform a career assessment to really establish what the career goals of the individuals are and what kind of field that they, they want to pursue. And then we have a job coach that kind of works not only with the employer but with the, with the individual to try to make sure they're successful. If we place them, we want to have supports around them to, to make sure that it's uh, not a disruption for the employer and it encourages them to continue to participate in the program. And so the incoming funds related to this agreement is if you do get a referral from uh, Voc Rehab and you place an individual, there are some funds, there's a sort of a percentage that, that you know, obviously the individual gets paid, but there's a percentage that goes to the vocational rehab program and then we get a, play, a portion of that as well. Again, for kind of the work that we're doing to kind of wrap around the individual to make sure that the placement is successful. Uh, so that's what the incoming funds related to this is. And really the, the core philosophy of our supported employment program is that you know, anyone, regardless of mental health challenges, substance use disorders, you know, whatever disabilities that they may have, that they are capable of working in competitive jobs in, in an area that, that they are passionate about and want to, to want to work in, and, and we really work to kind of break down barriers. I think that there's just so much inherent value in people that, um, you know, are, are now able to go to work every day and do something that they want to do and feel like they're giving back to the community and, and contributing. And I think that it's, it's one of those things that's a program that has a lot of really rewards related to that. I think it's something that we've been really successful with. Uh, our support employment program, we were initially a pilot program back in 2008. We were one of the first in the state to really say, you know what, yeah, we want to do this and kind of incorporate this into our behavioral health services. Uh, just to give you some data, in the, on the last contract with Folk Rehab, we, it was a two-year contract and we enrolled and served 201 individuals that were, were referred to us from uh, Folk Rehab. Uh, we had 93 individuals start jobs and we've had 25 people that graduated, so that means that they were successful on that job for over a year and so they no longer kind of needed our ongoing support. So that, that was pretty exciting. Uh, this program also, we don't talk about it as much, but we also have a supported education component because some people uh, maybe, you know, a job is, is not necessarily their, their first step. They need some education to kind of work towards that. And so uh, we had, uh, in terms of the last, I believe it's the last year, we had 426 credits attempted, so the individuals enrolled in that program had, had enrolled to, to achieve 426 credits, and they actually completed 299 of them with an overall average GPA of 3.13, uh, so pretty impressive, and we had you know, two people earn their GED, two people earned a four-year degree, so uh, and then three others uh, earned certificates, uh, I don't know exactly which they were, but they could be like welding certificates or other things to, to get into various professions, so it's been pretty successful. I think it's really rewarding to see people overcome you know challenges that they've had in life and, and and again be able to accomplish goals that they have for themselves and so it's a, it's a program we're really proud of and the partnership with folk rehab has been really successful for us so we're hoping that to have this agreement approved great thank you that's good work any questions I'm not entirely clear who is being referred and or what program they're being referred to. Are they coming into behavioral health and they're receiving behavioral health services on one side or the other and then are we're case managing them through their services that we would otherwise that we would be normally providing? We we do job? provide we do provide so they have to have like a mental health diagnosis. Um, okay. so usually they're enrolled in our behavioral health programs. I believe we also take referrals if they could be other in other outpatient programs, but it could be referred to us. So there are people that have mental health challenges and then we have a mental health staff that are trained kind of as support employment specialists yeah. and, and build relationships with different employers, you know, in the community. And so uh, so it's kind of built into sort of their treatment plan <laughs> and things and it's, it's it's helping them sort of achieve that next level of those next level of goals that they want to have. Perfect. Yeah. So that's great. I just want to make sure we're not taking on the responsibility of the state vocational rehabilitation. Oh, no, department. it's not just generic job <laughs> placement. Like, I didn't and, and we actually built that. this into our burn as well. We have supported employment for people yeah. with substance use disorder. That was something that previously they weren't necessarily eligible for this program unless you were co occurring and had mental health challenges. But it, it's a similar kind of thing where anybody within our burn can make referrals to our burn supported employment specialists who are then working to place individuals into Perfect. employment. Perfect. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah. Yeah, you know, work is a work. Work's a good thing. It's a blessing to be able to work. Yeah, it is absolutely. All right, Mr. Chair, if you're ready. Ready. I'll move that we approve the incoming funds inter intergovernmental agreement with the Oregon Department of Human Services in the amount of three hundred thousand to provide job placement services for vocational rehab participants that have been referred by ODHS through June thirtieth, twenty twenty-five. 
We second the motion. We have a motion to second. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion passes. Right. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Ryan. All right. Tom, I have your name up next. We're going to consider approval of the purchase and sale agreement with Castor Joint Revocable Living Trust in the amount of $360,000 for the purchase of a 6.03 acres of land adjacent to the Scotts Mills County Park. Yes. Good morning, Commissioners. Again, for the record, uh, Tom Kissinger, Parks Program Supervisor, uh, here seeking approval of a purchase and sale agreement with the Castor Re Joint Revocable Living, Living Trust and adoption of a board order authorizing the Public Works Director to sign closing documents. A little bit of background. In 2018, Marion County sold Auburn Park to the Salem-Kaiser School District to facilitate the expansion of Auburn Elementary School. Uh, the appraised value and sale price of that property was $360,000. Uh, the purchase and development of Auburn Park back in the 1970s utilized federal land and water conservation fund dollars, uh, which obligates the county to uh, purchase and replace the sold park property with new park land. Um, there are two components to what's known as a six, Section 6F conversion. Uh, the new property must have equal or better appraised value and equal or better recreational value. Uh, the Public Works Department has been working with the Castor family to fulfill these requirements through the acquisition of 6.03 acres adjacent to Scotts Mills County Park. Uh, staff have negotiated a purchase and sale agreement with the Castor Joint Revocable Living Trust to establish the terms of the proposed property sale to Marion County. Uh, the appraised property value and agreed upon purchase price is a total of $450,000 consisting of a $360,000 cash payment by the county and a $90,000 land value donation to the county by the trust. Upon <coughs> approval of the purchase and sale agreement, staff will begin the closing process and then begin the formal conversion process with the Oregon State Parks who manages the Land and Water Conservation Fund. Great. Uh, this will make that Scotts Mills Park much bigger yes and, so and really changes the amenities because you have sort of walking trails in the woods now rather yes. than just being sort of an open field um, so that's kind of pleasant yeah so the existing property uh, at scotts mills is 9.7 acres so this almost adds almost half uh, the existing land and to your point this is a great way to add some there's already some trail systems built in uh, that we just have to go in and clean up a little bit and we'll be able to add that for this summer yeah that's wonderful Okay, any other questions? No. Finally. Yep. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm very excited to be here today. Yep. Very good. All right. I'll take a motion. All right. I move to approve the purchase and sale agreement with Castor Joint Revocable Living Trust in the amount of $360,000 for the purchase of 6.03 acres of land adjacent to the Scotts Mills County Park in an order authorizing Brian Nicholas, Marion County Public Works Director, to act as a signatory during the closing <laughs> process. I'll second the motion. We have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Yeah. Please. This this brings back some post-traumatic stuff, right? I want to say thank you for finding this place. And, <laughs> and um, I remember the idea where it was. Do you remember this? Uh, I do. Oh, yeah. Okay, good. This has been really an um, important thing for us to get off, get off the books and get it done so that we can... Uh, apply for other grants, etc. So, yes. Tom, thank you for your work, Brian, and Brian sitting back there, and staff for putting this together, and let's get it signed and done. So, thank you. All right. Any further further discussion? No. Even though, I mean, you just basically crossed two separate things into this discussion because we're bringing this on the books. <laughs> well, what well, he means is I know what he meant. Okay. Yeah. yeah the, 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 so we can move on. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> we were being a good neighbor to the school district yes. by giving them our park. But then in order to be able to move forward with our park system, we have to trade, Place that, it. trade that money um, into a new park. And it's just been kind of hard to find another park. So. Yeah. Especially one that the community supports. Yes, yes. exactly. And this is one that, the <laughs> and this is one that they do. Yeah. All right. Very good. Okay. I see no other further discussion. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 The motion passes. All right, thank you, Tom. Oh, you're still here. I am and still here. Scott. And Scott. Scott's coming. All right, we're going to consider approval of the incoming funds post-fire recovery grant agreement with the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board. I always wondered what OWEB stood for. Uh, in the amount of $541,559 for restoration work 
uh, expenses in the county's right of way on North Fork Road and Gates Hill Road through June 30th, 2023. Hey, good morning, Scott. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, for the record, my name is Scott Wilson. I'm the Road Operations Division Manager for Marion County Public Works. Uh, I'm here this morning to uh, ask for your approval for, of a grant agreement with the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board, otherwise known as OWIP, for the post-fire recovery in the San Diem Canyon. A little background, uh, in September 2020, the Beachy Creek wildfire swept through the San Diem Canyon and devastated the natural environment. Hazard tree removal significantly impacted soils and watershed health, particularly in the riparian areas all along the North Fork San Yem River, the Little North Fork uh, San Yem River. Marion County Public Works maintains approximately uh, 200.37 acres of right of way on the North Fork Road and Gates Hills Road. Trees and vegetation loss in some of these areas was as high as 100%. Marion County Public Works has developed a restoration plan that will re revegetate the natural environment for public use, control noxious weeds that are spreading post fire and restore the critical habitat for fish and wildlife. Public Works applied for and was awarded a post fire recovery grant from OWEP to help with the cost associated with this restoration work in the county right away along North Fork Road and Gates Hill Road. The total grant agreement is for $541,559 with no required match from the county. Grant funding will provide for the following work items. And as I'd like to bring up, uh, have Tom uh, explain a little bit more in detail. He, he and both Stephanie was a trainer, but back there were very instrumental of uh, this grant uh, for the right of ways. So this is very similar to the grant agreement that we brought previously for the parkland. Uh, the only difference here is what type of land is being treated. Um, so on the, the board, you can see a kind of map that shows all of our various right of way. Uh, on the tour that we just did recently, you saw some of those areas as well. Uh, some of these areas are actually quite large and we own them down in fee simple the whole way to the river. Uh, we do have a legal requirement through Oregon Forest Practices Act to uh, revegetate those areas after a salvage harvest logging. And this uh, grant agreement will allow us to do that with no required match from the county. Uh, the grant agreement covers the contracted services and materials to provide that noxious weed control plant and in-site preparation. Uh, we will utilize the same contractor who's uh, currently working in the park system in order to maintain efficiency. It also provides one-year salary and benefits uh, for a full-time position to assist with coordination and inspection of the project. One of the biggest things that we're having issues with is just staffing to manage all of this, and this grant agreement provides for one full year of salary and benefits for that. Um, it also provides funds for a new mulching head for our current case excavator uh, to be used for maintenance of the plantings in the ditches along both of these roadways and training for staff on how to identify and control noxious weeds in the project area for the long term. Um, there's another thing in here that we do actually have, I believe it's $25,000 um, that's actually a pass through to the North Sanium Watershed Council for them to assist private landowners in the area as well. Uh, these areas are all interconnected and if private landowners don't have the resources to control their noxious weeds, they will spread through our property as well and we uh, were kind of forward thinking on that and put in some funds to assist the private landowners as well in this area. Great. Um, and you already started planting some of the trees, right? That's correct. So we've already started planting trees. We have trees secured for this season. Uh, most of those plants are in the ground because we're getting to the end of the planting season. Our big push will be uh, this coming winter, 2024. Great, that's wonderful. Mr. Chair, thank Please. you. Tom, I know we had <clears throat> a grant last year that we were concerned about carrying over. Can you, I don't want to mix the two. This is separate from that, right? Because that was a $600,000. Correct. This is a new grant agreement. It does have the same constraints. So OWEB's uh, budget is being heard by the Joint Ways and Means Subcommittee on Natural Resources this week. I believe it's the 19th and the 20th. Um, they do currently plan to carry this forward. Uh, we'll see what happens in that uh, public hearing. Uh, but we have, I believe we've signed on to a letter mm -hmm. of support. Yes, yeah. so so that grant, we're still trying to make sure that that one gets carried forward. Correct. And this is all a new one. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so thank you. So all of this we're trying to get carried forward for an yep. additional biennium. Any other questions? No. All right, and I will take a motion. Move your turn. Sure. Yeah, um, Mr. Chair, I'll move that we approve the incoming funds post-fire recovery grant agreement with the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board, known as OWEB 
in the amount of $541,559 for restoration work expenses in the county's right of way on North Fork Road and Gates Hill Road through June 30th, 2023. I second the motion. We have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 The motion passes. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Scott, you're staying, it looks like. All right, we're going to consider approval of the contract for services with Riverbend Materials and the not to exceed amount of $268,537.50 for the purchase of, ch of chip seal aggregate through October 31st, 2023. Do we do any chip sealing in Marion County, Scott? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, good morning. And once again, now my name is, for the record, my name is Scott Wilson. I'm the uh, Road Operations Division Manager for Marion County Public Works. I'm here uh, this morning to ask for your approval for a contract for services with Riverbend Materials for the purchase of chip seal aggregate, uh, PW-5334-23. The chip seal pavement preservation process involves the spraying of liquid asphalt on the road surface and covering the material with a layer of aggregate. This particular aggregate is needed for chip seals and it also uh, has a unique specification that's required for this process. This, the contract for services with Riverbend is for one term, one, is a one-year term, and is expected to fulfill this summer's workload. For fiscal year 23-24, the contract service for services payment amount for the aggregate is $268,537.50, and was awarded through an invitation to bid PW1291-23. This is a budget expenditure for the fiscal year 2022 and 23, and also 23 and 24. Chip seal treatments are an effective pavement maintenance treatment that provides a durable waterproof wear course and extends the life of our existing pavements. Public Works is targeting about 57 miles this summer for chip seals and will be focusing on our southern portion of Marion County. Um, let's see. Approval, uh, yeah, the options are to approve this uh, contract for services um, or, or deny. Uh, Public Works recommends the Board of Commissioners approve the contract for services to purchase the chip seal aggregate from Riverbend Materials. And I'm open for any questions you might have. Any questions? I might need to get a schedule of when this is all happening so I can avoid you all. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was just trying to read the, the, the chip seal and double chip seal. That we have one particular um, road identified where we're going to do a double treatment that that um, adds a little more durability to the to the pavement. Oh, uh, the sublimity, huh? Okay. Yeah. All right. Great. All right. I'll take a motion. All right. I move to approve the contract for services with Riverbend Materials and the not to exceed amount of two hundred sixty-eight thousand five hundred thirty-seven dollars and fifty cents for the purchase of chip seal aggregate through October thirty-first, two thousand twenty-three. I'll second the motion. We have a motion, a second. Is there any further discussion? I actually just have one question. We're purchasing the rock, right? Is that the gravel that yes. goes in the? I don't know what it is. is it, yeah, it's, it's uh, applied through our chip spreader that, that yeah that distributes the aggregate on top of the oil. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 The motion passes. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. Nice to see you. Okay. Now we are going to open a public hearing to consider mass gathering application for case number 23-001, White Wind Woodland, LLC. Good morning, Lindsay. <clears throat> For the record, Lindsay King, Marion County Planning. The item before you today is an application uh, for White Wind Woodland LLC for a large mass gathering permit on exclusive farm use zone property located on 6518 Cascade Highway outside of Silverton. The property is located on the south side of the highway in the southwest corner of Cascade Highway and Valley View Road. Surrounding properties consist of uh, farm use and timberland uh, all within the exclusive farm use zone. The applicant is, holding, is requesting to hold a Renaissance Fair as a large mass gathering. The event would take place on July 22nd, 23rd, 29th, and 30th of this year. Estimated attendance is less than 4,000 people, which is 
roughly a 1,000 person increase from the previous year where the applicant was holding a small mass gathering. Based on this information, the proposed event meets the definition of a large gathering. According to the information submitted with the application, sound amplification will be used, alcohol will be available, fireworks will not be sh used or shown, and the applicant states that that sound amplification will be used during the daily jousting shows at noon and 4 p.m. There will be no amplified sound after 11 p.m. or before 9 a.m. on any given day. Various governmental agencies were requested to assure that there are adequate facilities and services available. These agencies included Public Works, the Sheriff Department, Environmental Health, Risk Management, Local Fire District, and others. Each of these agencies was provided with a copy of the proposal and given opportunity to comment. All contacted agencies gave comments of approval or no opposition. In addition, no comments were received prior to this hearing from any neighboring property owners or anybody that was notified of the public hearing. Due to the reoccurrence of the mass gathering, this being its, I believe it's the 13th year, staff is requesting that the board approve the permit for the current year of 2023 and the three years following, ending in 2026. Chapter 19.25 requires that the large mass gathering have an approved conditional use permit, which the applicant has obtained and has been approved by the hearings officer earlier this year. That decision can be found in the file for reference. The board has options to continue the public hearing, close the public hearing and leave the record open, or close the public hearing, approve, deny, or modify the proposal. Staff would recommend that the board approve the request for the current year of 2023 and the three years following ending in 2026, subject to recommended conditions of approval. And with that, I'll be able to answer any questions you might have. Great, is there any questions? No. Pretty straightforward. Okay, we have one person signed up for public comment, Nancy White, are you here? You can come right up here to the front and let us know what you think. And uh, go ahead and introduce yourself for the record and give us your the record. Advice. My name is Nancy White. Um, I live in Silverton, and uh, I approve it. <laughs> 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 um, I actually own it, and um, I, we've been doing this for, well, this is our 13th year. Would have been 15, but we got shut down for the COVID. Mm. Um, we have had little or no trouble. Last year I did have a wee parking problem, but I have solved that with overflow parking. Excuse me, overflow parking um, with a school bus shuttle. Um, and uh, that's all in place and everything's done and we're just waiting to see where we go from here. But it's a really cool show. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> I was asking because I I'm, I'm interested in going <laughs> this never year. Cool. I've never been. So. Oh, you'll have fun. It right. really, it's, it's, there's something there for everybody. You know, the little kids. We've got carnival shows and um, or carnival period stuff though. It's not just you know games that kids can play. That they kind of played back in that period of the 1500s. Um, we have of course the jousting show, which is. Uh, really cool. Um, the uh, Seattle Knights are coming down for that. I have a group that came last year. It's so cool. They come up from Alabama. So, I mean, I've got people coming in from well, 15 states now. <laughs> anyway, um, they do mounted archery with trick riding. Do you know that trick riding was actually, is military? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, they'd be going along and the bad guys are here and, and they drop off to the side and the horses were simply a tool. I mean, I'm a professional horseman, so, you know. But anyway, yeah, so they, I mean, these skills are all over these horses, and then, and it's so cool. <laughs> awesome. awesome. So, um, you know, we've got two stages of entertainment um, and all kinds of entertainment throughout the, um, uh, the village. Um, food, uh, the alcohol is contained, and I, somebody else does that. Yeah, I get a vendor for that. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, um, he's been with us for all this time, and um, yeah, it's really, it's really a good show. Well, wonderful. Thank you for coming, and uh, thanks for, for your comments. Commissioners, do you have any uh, questions for, for Nancy? No, I've been. I think it's great. Oh, I think Marion <laughs> County has a Renaissance Fair, and Lane County has the Country Fair. 
Yep. We have a very, enough. yep. Country fair is different. But yes, it yeah. is. <laughs> Noted. <laughs> it's very different. But they're both fun. It's from I your generation. I haven't been seen there. <laughs> it, it's really, from my generation. It's really fun. No, no. My generation. That's the who. Uh huh. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, good. Okay. Great. All right. Uh, well, then, yeah, I take the motion. Mr. Chair, I move that we close the public hearing and um, approve the mass gathering application for case number 230-001, uh, Whitewood Woodland, LLC. I second the motion. We have a motion to second. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 The motion passes and the hearing's closed. Thanks for coming. Thank you for Grammar coming. Grammar C. Melodis, my lady, um, <laughs> which means thank you, 1500s. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for being have here. Have a good day. All right, see you soon. All right, I'm going to open a public hearing, yeah, uh, to consider mass gathering for application uh, case number 23-002, Bicery Farms and Paint Paul Incorporated. Is that how I say that, Austin? That's how I've been saying it. All right, there we go. <laughs> All right, for the record, Austin Barnes, Marion County Planning, um, Public Works Division. Uh, the item before you today is an application for a small mass gathering, mass gathering to take place May 5th, 6th, 7th on uh, 2023 on a total of 259 acres in EFU exclusive farm use zone um, land located at 20794 French Prairie Road Northeast just outside of St. Paul. The property is located on the eastern and the western sides of French Prairie Road, approximately 5,000 feet um, north of the intersection with the St. Paul Highway. The property is currently in farm use and has an orchard and also contains wooded areas that are not currently farmed. Um, surrounding uses are farm uses in all directions with adjacent parcels being zoned EFU and planted with various farm crops and nurseries. The area has a mix of farm parcels with dwelling and farm parcels without dwellings as is typical of the, um, the French Prairie uh, region. The applicant is requesting to conduct Super Game, which is a paintball gaming event as a small mass gathering event. According to information submitted with the application, sound amplification will be used, no alcohol will be available, and fireworks will not be used or shown. There will be no amplified sound after 11 p.m. or before 9 a.m. on any given day. Uh, the applicant has held this uh, event at the subject property since 2016 and has not experienced any issues related to traffic, parking, no safety, or noise. Uh, Marion County has not had to dispatch code enforcement or police to the event. Um, and the event is being run in the same fashion and footprint as previous years. Attendees are welcome to camp on the property and stay for the weekend while participating in various paintball games on courses located within the property. The estimated attendance is 1,500 persons per day and around 500 that stay over each night. The applicant has provided proof of insurance for the event as well as a clean supply of water and sanitation facilities for attendees. The applicant has also gathered signatures from the St. Paul Fire District County Environmental Health Division, Sheriff's Office, and the Public Works Traffic Division in support of their plan for the event. No public comments were received as part of this application. And the board has the option to close the public hearing and approve the request, close the public hearing and modify the request, or close the public hearing and deny the request. Staff recommends option one to close the public hearing and approve the request, and I will stand for any questions you guys might have. I just, yeah, on. Um, I don't know if it's the application, but on page five, there's an environmental services. I think this looks like it's submitted by the applicant. There's some notes at the bottom, but I can't, I can't read the first one. It looks like it has something to do with, it says pending drinking something. Um, pending drinking water, water. were test results for um, uh, chloroform and nitrate, which I've got. So this is just basically validating that these particular tests occurred and everything is copacetic? Yes, and they're, and they're okay. cool with everything that's happened. I've got the test results here if you guys care, but. I, I just wanted to make sure that's what that says. Totally. Thank you. Any questions, Commissioner Cameron? Yeah. Okay, I'm good. I have one person signed up for public comment. It looks like a Derek Stryker. Are you here? Good morning. Good morning, go ahead and introduce yourself for the record. Uh, my name is Derek Stryker, and I'm the event coordinator for Super Game. Okay. Uh, I'm here just to answer any questions you guys have, but um, thanks again for having us and 
we're looking forward to another five years of a great paintball event. Um, our campaign has grown substantially over the past few years, so now we're um, able to support some other local campsites. Shampooie Park is now one of our overflow um, partners, as well as some uh, hotels in the Newburgh area, the Holiday Inn. And Your question. Tell me about stay in Marion County. Yeah, stay in Marion <laughs> County. We have some people staying in. Um, I want to say it was somewhere down. Um, Woodburn. Woodburn, yeah. <coughs> My favorite birthday party ever was we went paintballing. Mm, really? I was like a little at up, up in Portland somewhere. Nice. It's a long, long it time out. ago. It's a good uh, spectator event as well. We have a lot of spectators come out just to watch the event and enjoy the vendors area. Um, we have a, our vendors area usually has 30 to 40 vendors of different um, kind of stuff and we're actually opening it up to more food vendors this year so we'll have five local food vendors uh, participating this year too. Okay. Some food trucks. So Austin, is this a, a five-year permit? Yeah, so this, every every five years, they come in for the renewal. Okay. Um, so this this is, we do a hearing once every five years, essentially, and this is that hearing. Okay, very good. Anything else, commissioners? Okay. I'm good. I actually really like the layout that you have here. It's easy to read as far as <coughs> safety, emergency management, and so forth. It's well done. Thank you. Yeah, it's a event, and we want to make sure it's as safe as we can. Be, so yeah. I'm sure the St. Paul community appreciates that. Yes. <laughs> they're, although they're used to large mass gatherings. <laughs> <laughs> at least one. At least, at least one. one. Yeah. Okay. I don't have any other questions. What's your motion? All right. I move to close the public hearing and approve a mass gathering application for case number 23-002, Bicery Farms and Paintball Incorporated. I'll second the motion. We have a motion to second. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion passes. That hearing is closed. Have fun. Thank you both. And I signed your proposal. Ah, we called your name, uh, but you weren't here. Thank you. Okay. Um, commissioners, would you like me to reopen public comment? I have an, a meeting, so as long as it's brief. Okay. Um, we normally limit public comment to two minutes, so that's what we'll do. Uh, Yep. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I'll support unanimous consent to return to public comment. Is there any objection? No. With a time limit. Okay. Seeing none, I'm going to return to public comment and call, is it Keisha? Yes. Uh, Keisha, and what's your last name? <coughs> Why don't you come over here to this one and then go ahead and introduce yourself for the record. Your microphone's Your not microphone on. Your microphone is not on. Is it on now? Hello? Yep. I, I wanted to bring to your attention that I, um, I filed a protection order uh, of my, um, my, for my protection of my life, protection of my property, and um, protection um, over, you know, uh, myself. And so uh, the, re the reason it was necessary, um, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's in the court filings. Um, I believe the court case number is... Uh, uh, 23 CV 1503 <coughs> and um, there's more detail in there and it's applicable um, to uh, some of the funding um, here and that's all going to be in the court filings and so I wanted you to be aware of that because right now uh, some of these different um, locations that that are involved and that you should be aware that um, some some of what they're involved in is violations of people's um, rights, and specifically myself, because um, behavioral health uh, is, uh, you know, violation of people's rights and uh, controlling be uh, someone trying to control somebody else's behavior um, under the guise of you know we're going to help you, but only help themselves to somebody else's estate. And that shouldn't give somebody the right to, um, you know, in order to get help, in order to, you know, waive all these rights. That's just um, unacceptable and um, not okay. So that's why I filed that to, uh, you know, uh, re begin to resolve these. But there was a hiccup over um, 
and so uh, at the courthouse and the judge signed the order to for the sheriffs to have those things served to you and others thank you okay thank you all right is there anything else commissioners before we adjourn i had fun last night <laughs> you actually did a really good job i i mean while i watched it i'm not exactly sure but uh I appreciate it. Why you would watch that? I yeah. Don't know. Well, I was really interested let's, in. Let's give some some context, context here. So your so role I'm last on, night. I'm, I after the fires, I volunteered to uh, be on the planning commission in Detroit. Mm -hmm. And so one of the issues in Detroit has always been forever RVs and what you can do and can't do. And uh, the planning the. the the city council has worked on some stuff and the planning commission has worked on some stuff. So last night we had an in-person and of course Dean reminded me, O'Donnell, the chair, that I, I was the one that suggested it be in person, right? Instead mm -hmm. of uh, virtual. virtual. And he reminded me it was my idea. And I go, why are we here? And he says, your idea. So we had this public hearing on, um, well, we reviewed the whole code uh -huh. in Detroit. Over the last year, we've mm -hmm. been reviewing the code with, um, McRae, Carmichael. Um, and uh, so last night was to adopt that code and make a recommendation similar to what we did here just recently with our code, right? And, but there was a little piece in there that was about RVs and the whole letter went out signaling that. So, so did you guys make a recommendation? We made a recommendation. Okay. It was, it was. Did you agree with the recommendation? I, well, I was the one that made the recommendation. Okay. What was the recommendation? I, I, it was well, a long one. The recommendation was to uh, adopt the the code as presented, okay. um, and add a um, conditional use um, for people who wanted to come in and apply as a RV park. Okay. Because because the the code would not allow RV parks the, the code, outside of a conditional. The code use. we adopted basically says you can have one RV year round in your spot um, for storage. You mm -hmm. can live in it, you know, during the season, mm -hmm. and then you can add one RV during the season. So from April first to October, or whatever. Okay. It is. Okay. So you know you you have that, and and you had testimony from people that had half acre lots. Yeah. And. Um, you know they can easily do setbacks and, and things on a half acre and put four RVs on it. So um, there's some people that don't want any RVs, right? Uh, I see. I live across from an RV park up there, basically. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Um, and like a and literal I, RV park. Yeah, and <laughs> and I did I did say, uh, you know the the way I got to Detroit was in 1999. I put my RV over at Canes. Hmm. And then I was over at the hotel, and I was in it, you know, until 2012, I was in an RV every summer. So that's how I think people grow up there. They come to love the place, and then they make investments, and they stay. Some of these families probably won't build, but um, anyways, it'll inter be interesting because we made a rec that recommendation to the city council, and then they have a public hearing on May 9th. And okay. they're going to maybe twist it a little bit, or they may accept it, I don't okay. know. Okay. But between now and then, we have to figure out what that motion really means. Local government at work. Well, Look well, at you. What's a conditional use permit for a for an RV park? And what does it take? And I, I think it would be almost impossible hmm. to get it done. Which Why? Well, well, I need to go back and talk to McRae and see what hoops somebody would have to jump through. Because she stated last night that it would... It, in their code, it can be done on a residential or commercial property. Right. She said that. There's others that say, no, it can only be done on commercial property. So if, if you have a residential property of a quarter of an acre or whatever, you, if that's right, you have to convert that to commercial property and then be able to do it. Got it. I don't know. These are things that I am glad as a commissioner that I'm, I'm doing I don't and have, not you. I don't have to figure out. Well, but you got I, you're rolling up your sleeves I, in your community. I didn't so need to do one good. more thing, but it was because of the community and the wildfire that I thought, okay. And yeah, Dean's been there for ten years, and Gina's really good. I mean, we've got Gina, and then you got Michelle, um, uh, and then Kate, uh, Katie. Uh, I'm trying to think her name. Uh, Lance is Katie. Lance and Katie. You don't know. Them. I don't know. She just joined. So. so you got a good group. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Yeah. So that's what I did last night, and uh, then there was a little bit of an after debrief at Pages, which was interesting. All right. Yeah. There you go.
go. Really local. Very local. Very local. I love that community. Yeah. That's fun. It's a wonderful community. Anything else? Mr. Bethel? Okay. Then we're adjourned. See you next week, everybody.